Hello, History 363. So I want to talk a little bit about origin stories some more. Again, the civic myth of Rome um, and how that myth may eventually shape what the Romans think about themselves. Um, and again, I want to stress that we should be very cautious of looking for any kernel of truth about Roman history in the 8th or 7th centuries BC when we're thinking about the, the legends that are told about the kings. Um, the early kings, Romulus and Pompilius, um, uh, are, seem to be completely mythical, completely fictional. Um, I would actually accept that probably some of the, the later kings, uh, Servius Tullius, uh, Tarquin Superbus, um, are um, historical figures, even if they too have some myths that have accrued around them. Um, but frankly, we just can't know that much about Rome in the time of the kings. Um, but again, the stories that the Romans tell about their kings um, are important for community self-definition. So let's go back to Romulus. He's killed his brother Remus. He's brought together um, a, a group of, of uh, rogues, former rogues on the, at the asylum on the Capitoline, uh, forming a non-Autochthonous Roman community. Um, but he's got a bit of a problem. Um, he uh, doesn't have any women. Um, it's all guys. Um, and so they come up with a plot to capture women. And the plot is they're going to invite the neighboring Sabine people who live up uh, to the, uh, kind of up the Tiber in the, in the Apennine highlands, the highlands leading up to the Apennine mountains, um, uh, say, hey, what would, you, uh, would you like to come? We're going to put on some great games and everyone should come, bring your families and see them. Um, and so all the Sabines bring their their daughters, um, and they're all watching the games, and that at a given moment, um, the Romans ambush them, drive off the saving men, and, and kidnap their daughters, and marry them. This is an incident that's oftentimes referred to as the rape of the saving women. Um, now, the uh, Romans then say, and again, this is all a story, we shouldn't see this as a, as a historical event, that these Sabines organize themselves um, uh, and counterattack. Um, they, they are aided actually by one woman named Tarpeia, who admits the Sabine soldiers um, uh, 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 on the promise that they give her um, what they're wearing on their left hand, thinking that all the soldiers have a, a golden torque and she'd like all their torques in exchange for betraying Rome. Um, the soldiers instead take their shields and crush her to death with it. A, a very sort of simple moral story of what happens to traitors. So a, a great battle breaks out between the Romans and the Sabines. Um, and we're told that the war is ended by the Sabine women themselves, who have since been married to Roman husbands and produced Roman children, um, and uh, say, this is, you put us in a terrible spot because our fathers are fighting our husbands and we want you to make peace instead. Um, that's a, I mean, you can tell the patriarchy wrote this story because that's the re resolution they come up to what is initially described as a mass uh, abduction and sexual assault. Um, suffice it to say, peace is made, and indeed in some versions of the story, the king of the Sabines, uh, Titius Titius, um, becomes uh, 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 the um, co-king of Rome, along with Romulus, so Titus and um, uh, Romulus rule together. Um, so this is another story that we have. On one hand, again, we, we have another non-autochthonous addition to the Roman citizen body, women from outside the city of Rome. Um, I really doubt that this story is necessarily based on any kind of anthropological tradition of, uh, of wife stealing, um, which does happen in, uh, in some cultures, um, uh, in, including actually the native peoples in upstate New York. Um, but um, rather, I think it's a way of thinking about how, the, again, the Rome is a non-autochthonous community where everyone comes from somewhere else. Romulus comes from Albalonga, the, the women come from Sabine country, um, uh, and the men come from all over to the Capitoline Asylum. Um, it also is a way I think about 
uh, of thinking about and, 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 and both kind of problematizing and then paradoxically maybe normalizing Roman conquest. The idea that the Romans in the story do this really rotten, rascally thing, but because they then incorporate the Sabines into their own citizen community, it sort of becomes okay. And indeed, the Sabine women acquiesce. Um, to their forced inclusion. So I think that's a way of thinking about what the Romans are doing to other Italian peoples as they conquer them. Um, uh, and in some ways, the, the, the rape of the Sabine women becomes this kind of uh, uh, example of how conquest works. The Sabine women don't like it initially, but at the end are so embedded in Roman society that uh, they refuse to resist any longer and, and seem happy with their circumstances. Um, so um, uh, that, that is, again, an, a, another story of Romulus and how he, he continued to grow the citizen body. Um, the Romans believe that Romulus, uh, who was a kind of a warrior king, engaged in a whole series of wars, enlarged Roman territory, um, and then uh, died and in some way died and ascended to heaven. Um, uh, and Romulus subsequently is apotheos apotheosized um, uh, here's an apotheosis um, to uh, Quirinus, a, um, a, a, a sort of a minor uh, god in the Roman panth uh, pantheon. Um, so uh, Romulus is therefore gone. Um, the next king is Numa Pompilius. Um, and the Romans basically, again, in, in trying to simply explain how their institutions came about, say that Numa Pompilius, unlike Romulus, is, is not a warrior king. Um, instead, he is, uh, uh, deals with matters of religion. They, they credit Numa Pompilius with setting up Rome's religious institutions. Um, and uh, again, a lot of that I don't think is historical, but the Romans sort of need to explain, well, you know, why do we do things a certain way? Well, that's what Numa Pompilius set up way back in the day. Um, so it's a sort of just so. Um, way of explaining how the Roman community uh, ultimately came about. Um, and so the Romans believe that altogether that there are seven kings. Now, these seven kings rule um, for a period of, uh, of roughly 250 years, um, and these, that, that gives each one both kind of a long, improbably long, and somewhat improbably uniform reigns. And that's one reason to think that there were probably are there more kings um, uh, uh, than, uh, than the sort of canonical seven, um, or that you know, we're not getting the whole story? Um, now, I talked about kernels of truth. Um, one thing that I think uh, is unquestionable is that Rome was ruled by kings, that early Rome was ruled by uh, uh, a officer called a rex, um, and we actually have epigraphic evidence, the so-called lapis niger, um, which is a black stone um, that is buried in the Roman form. It has a very, one of the earliest Latin inscriptions on it, um, and one of the words that can be made out. People still debate the exact meaning of the stone. Um, it seems to uh, be a kind of, it, 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 is, it is a, uh, has some issues with religious ritual and regulation, religious ritual. Again, the details are disputed. Um, there's no question that it says Rex on the on the Lapis Niger. So um, we, we know that there were indeed kings. Um, and so if we want to look for a kernel of truth, the fact that Rome imagines its early rulers as kings is probably accurate. Um, again, we should not probably think about them necessarily as, you know, what we would think about as a medieval monarch you know, sitting in a throne um, or you know, French absolutism. Um, they may have been uh, uh, you know, chieftains, and, and the exact nature of, their, uh, nature of their power is also disputed. Um, there are some schools of thought that suggest that the king is basically a kind of uh, religious and ritual figure. Um, there's other schools of thought that see them as actually qu quite strong. Um, uh, <clears throat> The, uh, there are a couple of interesting things. And again, this goes to kind of kernel of truths, or at least it's, it's odd that when the Romans caught a, concocted the story, they, they, they didn't do some things. Most of the kings are not hereditary until the, the later kings, um, uh, where there is a, the, sort of the Tarquin family um, holds the, the, the last set of kingships. But most of the early, king, the early kings are not related to one another. 
Um, and so it may be that this was not envisioned as a hereditary monarchy, but the old king died or was killed and then a new king was elected. And the Roman tradition does hold that kings had to be elected by the Roman people, whether that reflects archaic constitutional arrangements or whether it um, sort of it, it retrojects more Republican ideals, it's hard to say. Um, um, but the, the election or, or uh, acclamation of, of kings in the ancient world is, is certainly not unheard of. Macedonian kings, for example, have to be um, elected slash acclaimed by the Macedonian army assembly. Um, uh, so I think we can say there were kings, um, and then the monarchy ultimately comes to an end. Now, interestingly enough, we know that you know, we're, we're told more about the later kings, that there's aspects of them uh, that, that do seem to be historical. So maybe the most important of the later kings is Servius Tullius. Um, and the Romans believe that Servius Tullius undertakes a major reform to the organization of the citizen body um, with the main goal of reforming the citizen army. Um, so he uh, creates what is oftentimes called the Servian constitution or the centuriate system. He organizes a census and then assigns different census classes to everyone based on how much money they have. And what census class you have determines where you serve in the Roman army. Now, the Romans believe that the system of Servius Tullius was actually quite complex. Five classes, um, not counting the equites above and the proletariat below. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that class system as we talk about Roman institutions. There is some evidence preserved in antiquarian uh, authors that the system may have been much more simple, simply who could serve as a heavy infantryman and who couldn't. Um, but the, 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 the overall sense I think we should get is it probably is historical that Servius Tullius reforms uh, how the Roman army is recruited and organized um, and probably does it so that he actually has a... a force that he can interface with to both make him a more militarily effective leader um, and prop up his position of power, although the tradition holds that he is ultimately murdered. Um, now, the last king of Rome is Tarquin the Proud, um, and the Romans have a very elaborate and, I suspect, largely fictional myth about how Tarquin the Proud is overthrown. Um, they tell a story that Tarquin uh, is, they're off, the Romans are off campaigning, and Tarquin's son um, is uh, among a group of nobles who are uh, basically sitting around the fire and, and saying how wonderful their wives are. Um, and in the story, um, uh, the uh, men all say, you know what, we've been talking about our wives, let's just go and, and basically spy on them, and we can all see who has the better wife. And in the story, they all go back and they all find as they spy on their wives that most of their wives aren't as wonderful as they said. They're, they're drinking and partying and carousing, except one wife is doing exactly what a Roman matron should be doing, um, sitting there by the fire, spinning wool to you know, make a tunic for her husband. Um, and that woman is the wife of Lucius Collatinus named Lucretia. And supposedly Tarquin, the, the son of Tarquin, Superbus, the younger Tarquin, becomes so enamored with Lucretia um, that he is determined to rape her. Um, and so he comes up with a, a, a very devious plan um, because he believes that he simply, if he simply threatens to, to kill her unless she submits to his sexual advances, she'll say, well, then kill me. And so what he instead threatens her with as he's he sort of cornered her, is that if she doesn't submit to his, uh, his sexual advances, that he will um, uh, uh, kill her and a male slave um, so that it will look as if they had, in, you know, had some kind of, of murder pact. Um, and and this will uh, this will defile her name forever. This is this is how he this is how he manages to um, ultimately rape her with with a with a kind of elaborate threat. Um, now, Lucretia um, the next day goes out to the Roman people, announces the crime has taken place, um, and again you can tell that the patriarchy wrote this because she then says. 
um, because, even though I'm blameless, um, because I don't want my example to be used by other women who, want, who would uh, have some kind of affair and then uh, say it was a rape and then uh, say, well, Lucretia was raped, so it's okay because she's so virtuous. Um, Lucretia kills herself in, in sort of uh, among the public. Um, uh, so uh, on one hand, we have sexual assault being used by the Romans as a political metaphor. And it's actually a metaphor that the Romans have been using to think with a lot as they construct their civic myth. I mean, we've actually sort of seen this a lot in the last two videos. The rape of Rhea Silvia by Mars, the rape of the Sabine woman, the rape of Lucretia. It's not the last time this theme of sexual assault being used to think about the formation of the community, the nature of the community, good governance of the community is mobilized. And I should stress, mobilized by Roman men. Um, as you can tell, none of these stories are particularly female friendly. Um, and oftentimes they liquidate, uh, as in the case of Lucretia, they liquidate the female hero heroine. So Lucretia is dead, but the Romans are appropriately outraged. They're, they're motivated by her virtue and outraged at what's happened to her. And so in 509 BC, according to most the Romans' own kind of internal chronology, they drive the Tarquins out. They, they drive out not just that rotten son, but also his father, and establish a republic, um, which is not going to be governed by kings, but is going to be governed by um, elected magistrates. Um, now, again, uh, uh, I think the basic gist of the last Tarquin being overthrown and a republic being established in the late 6th century is right. This is where, you know, there is probably more than a kernel of truth in the civic myth. I don't think for a minute, though, that we should necessarily um, have to believe that Lucretia existed or was a real person. Um, this is an elaborate, I mean, uh, uh, a story that's been developed um, to I explain what was probably a poorly understood aristocratic coup. Um, but nonetheless, by 509, the kings, the, the era of the kings has ended and the Roman Republic has begun. Um, so we will talk more next week, um, but for right now, um, we've talked about some origin stories, we've talked about early Italy, um, and now we're going to start looking at Rome in the early Republican period. Um, so see, see you next week.